Warning, this podcast contains language that some people may find offensive, and those people can go fuck themselves. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by ZipRecruiter and by Filling the President with Peaches? Nancy Donahue says yes. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Andrew Torres, and I have good news, everyone. If you're on the West Coast and you can't make the Citation Needed live show in New York on Saturday, October 12th, we've got an opening arguments live show just for you in Los Angeles with a few seats remaining. The link's in the show notes. And oh yeah, as general counsel for Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC, I assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's October 3rd. And it's National Virus Appreciation Day. What? What? Yep. Not sure what we're supposed to celebrate, but uh, it, it is a catchy title. There you go. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm catchy. Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Susan Sarandon's New Jersey, <laughs> Cincinnati Swing State, and Good Husband Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the nation's preeminent Christians refuse to turn our president into a peach. Lindsey Graham explains that if you hear something, it doesn't count if you say something. <laughs> and Hillary Morgan Ferrer will try to acronym again. But first, the diatribe. You know, I've got to admit, when I first got into this atheism thing, I thought the intellectual end of it was going to require a lot more effort. I expected at some point that they'd at least give me a challenge. See, like most Americans who weren't raised with a lot of church, and I viewed Christianity as the benign ignorance that pop culture kind of sells it as, right? Like, our culture doesn't have any problem presenting that Christian lady as prudish and tyrannical. It doesn't have any problem presenting the televangelist as greedy and hypocritical. You, you actually do get some of the negatives painted into your movies and TV shows and shit like that. But the religion itself is always treated with kid gloves. So if you're not intimately familiar with it, you come away with what I consider the standard interpretation of Christianity in America. It's a moral system founded by a great moral leader that's all too often misused by greedy or unscrupulous people. But it turns out that if I'd thought Christianity was a potato, I'd have been closer to the truth. Holy fuck did I have it wrong. I mean, sure, pop culture wasn't afraid to occasionally poke fun at religion, but Jesus was always treated as though he was this great moral teacher. Even secular authorities tended to grant him that. But when you look at the shit he actually says in his book, there's very little of it that one can claim as moral. I mean, sure, he utters some shit that passes ethical muster now and again, but it's certainly not his defining characteristic. He spends most of that time warning about the impending end of the world and convincing people to abandon their families. The Sermon on the Mount is 90% bullshit about how the world's going to end way before now with the occasional love people tossed in to make it seem a little more poetic. In fact, the only way you can even mistake Jesus for a moral character is by tossing him after 39 books of Old Testament rape apologetics and genocide instructions. But like most people before I read it, I expected the Bible to be a book of morality too. It seems childishly naive today, but I mean, think about what the Bible has sold to you if you're not plugged into the atheist community. Even secular authorities will tell you that it's a good book, that it represents great literature, that it has important ethical parables in it. And then you read the fucking thing and you realize that anyone who ever said that never read it. So, yeah, I got into this thing with all these arguments in my head along the lines of, yes, I get that your religion teaches you a bunch of moral stuff and encourages you to be a good person. But divorcing oneself from reality and encouraging others to do the same isn't worth the ethical gains you might achieve. And I've never needed any of them because all the world's religions are fucking horrible. And strangely enough, this manages to be a bit of a disadvantage to the atheist. I mean, obviously, there are plenty of people in denial who just pretend their book doesn't say what their book says. But there are also more honest people who try to hide religion itself behind the horrors of major religion. I, I mean, I know that sounds paradoxical, but it works out fine for them. In fact, it makes them seem like the reasonable ones from time to time. 
The argument that goes something like this. They listen to the atheist grievances about Christianity, Islam at all, and they nod along and they agree with you throughout. But rather than landing on the logical conclusion that religion itself is bad, they say that those religions are bad or more likely the modern interpretations of those religions are bad. And when there are such obvious flaws in all the major religions and all the interpretations of them, it's much easier to argue that those flaws are the real problem. They're wrong, but it's an easy thing to argue. It even like satisfies that modern desire to find a nice middle ground and chastise both sides in the argument. But there's a reason why humanity has never produced a good religion. And it's not that a few bad people keep sneaking in and hamstringing their efforts. Religion, by its very nature, demands a divorce from reality. That's what it is. That's the definition. And it really doesn't matter if you're shortcutting logic to get to a good thing. If I tell my kids the monster under his bed's going to eat him if he doesn't finish his peas, I haven't done a good thing, regardless of how healthy peas are. In fact, one cannot even theoretically create a good religion. Right. Like if you and I were tasked with writing a book that was going to later be convincingly presented to the world as the word of God, there would be no ethical way to fulfill that request. I mean, sure, we could fill it up with the most benevolent dictates we could think of. But sooner or later, those would either be perverted by less scrupulous adherence to our new faith or they'd become outdated by new technology or knowledge. You know, all those wacky Sabbath restrictions for Judaism can be traced back to logical and even beneficial roots. I, okay, not all of them, but most of them. But the restriction on shellfish kind of falls apart once we learn about allergies and shit. Of course, you can't revise the word of God, so what might have been crafted with only the best of intentions becomes poisonous simply by attributing it to God. And that shouldn't be a shocker, should it? Pretending that you're speaking for an all-knowing being even when you know you're not. And yet millions upon millions of people have convinced themselves that the real problem is that nobody's lied well enough yet. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Vini and Vidi to my Vici Heat then right and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to come and or watch one another come? <laughs> yes. Um hmm. I came, I saw, I concurred. No, oh, there you go. Yes. You guys are being like super casual about us all just jerking off in front of each other. Can I say that? I don't I don't think it can be done formally. I'm wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. In our lead story tonight, the president of the United States is the beginning of that sentence. And that means it's time for another Christian freak out, <laughs> Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freak out. That's right. A thing is happening to Donald Trump and Christians are freaking out. So in case you missed it, he got elected president with the help of Vladimir Putin in 2016. And now with the 2020 election coming up, Trump had one of his aides call up, quote, that other Russian guy I know. Um, that would be Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, our adulterous leader who's been accused several times of sexual assault and admitted to sexual assault out loud into a microphone because he's an idiot. and hates refugees like Jesus did not and hates poor people like Jesus did not and thinks he found wisdom in I, I Corinthians. <laughs> that guy is possibly getting impeached and Christians are having a meltdown thanks to their amazing source of absolute morality. Yeah, I mean, for fuck's sake, at this point, he's even cheating on Vladimir Putin, Christians. <laughs> uh, and long last, it's good to see the people who called for Obama to be impeached for crimes as heinous as wearing a beige suit and as imaginary as taking away their guns call for some <laughs> civility and pause in the impeachment mm -hmm. process. <sighs> yeah, so first up on the freakout list, we have Texas megachurch pastor and cuckold muppet Robert Ooh. Jeffress. <laughs> He's part of the official White House Evangelical Advisory Board. And he actually gave the sermon that Trump attended on the day he was inaugurated. And during an interview with Lou Dobbs on Fox News last week, Jeffress, <laughs> he accidentally explained exactly how hypocritical the Christian right is. According to Bobby J, quote, since Monday night, I've spoken to thousands of Christians. Huh. He said, yeah, he said this on Thursday, yeah. by the way, three <laughs> days later. So at minimum, he had conversations with about 
666 Christians a day during that span. That's a lot. Plus a couple minimum, more. Minimum, yeah, least. minimum. <laughs> Continuing, I've never seen Christians as angry about anything as they are about the attempt to remove this president from office. End quote. I'm telling you, Lou, the Christians have gone full Starbucks cup this time. We are not to be fucked with. I'm telling well, you. Well, okay, <laughs> but to be fair, that was just his best interpretation of what they meant after all the meth that he had to use to stay up for those three straight days of two minute and eight second conversations. <laughs> so you pissed off good. You pissed off good. You pissed off good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Clearly unaware of the bad guy from the Civil War. Jeffers <laughs> is not clear on that. He also added, quote, if the Democrats are successful, it will cause a civil war like fracture in this nation. End quote. Again, not clear on the good guy and the bad guy. Oh, no. What would we do without checking my notes here? Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So next up, we have. Family Research Council President and Assistant Cuckold Muppet, Tony Perkins. <laughs> yeah, that fits. That fits, too. And, uh, yeah, they're definitely a little team. And when he's not running a literal hate group, Tony Perkins spends most of his time calling for the impeachment of Barack Obama uh, about once a week for eight years. And more recently, he spends his time explaining how Impeachment should really be replaced by elections. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> According to Perkins, quote, in July, which is a weird time to point this out, in July, a survey showed that just 21% of Americans supported impeachment. Since then, Breitbart points out, <laughs> not much has changed. What? And I mean, bad <laughs> yeah. source, but that's actually true. Breitbart remains really bad at counting numbers. Well, <laughs> that has not changed. He continued, if you want to remove Donald Trump from office, do it the old fashioned way. Win an election. I'm sorry. End quote. Nothing's really changed. Well, if you think about it, it's even less illegal now than in July because now Ukraine has the money. <laughs> they have it now. <laughs> All right. And last but not least on the freak out list, we have GOP senator and Baptist piglet Lindsey Graham. <laughs> Fabulous. Fabulous you metaphor. might remember him from that time. His entire face turned from its normal piglet fuchsia all the way to safety cone orange while he <laughs> squealed at Democrats for asking about Brett Kavanaugh's n not raping calendar that he has. <laughs> um, or maybe you remember Lindsey Graham as the model for Edward Munch's The Scream. <laughs> well, that's the guy. According to Graham, this whole Ukraine thing shouldn't count because it's hearsay. Fucking mm -hmm. idiot. <laughs> he tweeted, in America, you can't even get a parking ticket based on hearsay testimony, but you can impeach a president? Um, um Yes, to both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, yep. uh, first of all, they don't give parking tickets for spoken words. They're uh, <laughs> mostly given for parking right, stuff. Right, yeah, no. <laughs> but um, more importantly, hearsay testimony is pretty much the entire nature of whistleblowing in speaking-based crimes. Yep. Yeah. Like, for example, bribing foreign leaders to meddle in U.S. elections. Because you heard him say it. You yeah. Say, uh, it's a, you, see, you hear a saying. Yeah. Just remember when Lindsey Graham had a soul? Nope. Sure. Yeah, no. no, fair criticism. But like, what what did he possibly receive in return for this? This <laughs> right? We're three years in. It's over. He looks like someone tried to make a jack o' lantern out of an old peach. Whatever deal he <laughs> took, it wasn't worth it. No, it was not worth it. No. Yeah, you don't have a soul for being pro Ted Cruz for a little yeah. while. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Nope. Sorry, I forgot that was the high point of his morale. <laughs> that was the high point. <laughs> yeah. That was his moral high ground, Ted Cruz. Nope. <laughs> and in church state supplication news, taxpayers in the Memphis suburb of Collierville, Tennessee. Go Dragons. Ooh, ooh. Yep, there you go. Learn this week that their tax money will be used to support a Bible museum with a mission statement that reads in part, quote, 
Our convictions regarding the authenticity of the scripture and our zeal for its message to all the world compel us to seek to engage the entire community with the historical and cultural background of the Bible, the living word of God. End quote. No. Yeah, we should clarify that by go dragons, Heath meant we hope the city gets eaten by dragons. Just, right. Just no, not the high yeah. school mascot or anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but don't worry, though. City Commissioner Reginald Milton assures us that they're talking about a secular zeal for the authenticity of Christian scripture here. So it's OK. It's fine. Yeah. This is how American Christians pass the lemon test now by cheating off the Buddhist kid. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Seems like that shouldn't. Count. I don't know. I'll ask a lawyer. So, yeah, apparently the city commission voted to approve a payment of $15,000 to the museum, even after the Freedom From Religion Foundation stepped in to remind them that that shit ain't legal. Uh, the museum director had asked for $25,000 to help cover operating expenses and explained that they have a new attraction coming this year that's going to represent 10% of the museum's annual budget. So they really need that help. Now, the reports don't specify what the annual budget is, but if it's pegged to their actual revenue... That means that that exhibit will be worth negative five thousand dollars based on their twenty eighteen <laughs> filings. All right, next up in headlines, we actually have some good news. Ooh, out of Texas! The hell good you news say? Out of Texas. <laughs> During the halftime show at the football game last week between <laughs> Rice University and Baylor, the Rice marching band dedicated their entire performance to mocking the opposing school for being run by horrible homophobic bigots. I love this so it's much. the best. This is fantastic. <laughs> so instead of their normal Star Wars show, the band adapted their routine to include a rendition of YMCA, and it was accompanied by rainbow flags, and it ended with the whole ensemble spelling out pride across the center <laughs> of the field. And apparently the Rice band leaders held a dedicated meeting to spite the bigots. They had a spite of bigots <laughs> meeting, and I think that's fantastic, and it totally worked. That type of meeting should be happening constantly all over the place for football games, anything you can come up with. And, well, right, and and I, I get it. This was great. No, I don't mean to, to knock them for their efforts, but you're overthinking this. Two dudes fucking would have been more fun to watch, more to the point, both figuratively and otherwise. Next time, just have two dudes fuck. Yeah, 50 yards. that's line. fair. That's fair. Also, the video, the tiny clip of it is fucking amazing. You have never seen a more pro gay sports crowd since Derek Jeter was on the Yankees. It is incredible. <laughs> what? Okay. So I'm just going to push right past that. So Derek Baylor Jeter is a closeted is a homosexual. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> okay. So Baylor is a Baptist university. That's notoriously terrible about LGBT issues. This includes their official statement on human sexuality that says sexuality is a gift from God given to one man and one woman. And then they added the words in a marriage so that they could go ahead and condemn unmarried heterosex too and be woke, I guess. <laughs> um, the statement also bans every student from being part of any kind of group that acknowledges the existence of non-biblical sex. But worst of all, that's all terrible, no question. But worst of all, Baylor is responsible for educating Jeff Dunham <laughs> in his <laughs> oh. piece of shit ventriloquism comedy act. I want this guy to get murdered with a jalapeno on a stick. I hate <laughs> him so much. Okay, as someone who absolutely loved Jeff Dunham as a kid. I did too. I did uh, too. He does not hold up. He nope. is no. the statue of Southern generals of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're terrible. And that's why I'm hoping this trend that Rice just started gets taken even further. Anytime a bigot school like Baylor tries to play a football game or do anything, just like... Nothing but marching bands playing spite music for hours, pretending the football team is just about to come out of the locker room. <laughs> and they never do. They never, ever do. Just a giant gay musical filibuster. And the bigots don't even know it's a filibuster. And in pro giving me life news tonight, pro forced birth advocate, Representative Sean Duffy is retiring this month to spend more time with his ninth goddamn oh, child. Fuck you. But before he goes, he wants to leave behind one more bill to establish his legacy in spite of 
voting against gay marriage and federal protections for LGBTQ workers, there is one part of the gay community he's dedicated to protect. That's right. Gay fetuses. What? (laughs) Just Sean Duffy with a dildo watching an ultrasound. So like, all right, I put it in there. It goes into the uterus. That's how that works. And then we see if the baby boy puts its mouth on the rubber dick. And then we'll, <laughs> that's the test. <laughs> that is right. One of his last acts as representative of government, for real, in a real way as an adult, is the introduction of a bill that would make it illegal to terminate the pregnancy if a fetus is gay. I will be 0% surprised to learn later that he did this to protect his interest in a conversion therapy clinic. (laughs) Yeah, so here's how Duffy's, let's call it, thinking goes. As science improves, we'll discover that gene that makes you gay. You know, one that's a light switch without a dimmer, you see. Yeah. It's just Paul Linder Snooky in your genome on or off for the gayness. (laughs) Okay, well, I mean, this doesn't interfere with the plan too much. We're... We're killing bisexual fetuses, right? We just keep going. <laughs> and and that's still, that's pretty much all of yeah, them still. Yeah, yeah. Full know. speed ahead. Think it through, Sean Duffy. Stupid. Exactly. Stupid plan. Yeah. You're not going to stop us. Also, Snooky's bisexual. <laughs> right. So when scientists discover that, you know, bright pink gene, bigots like Duffy are going to stop oppressing gay people while they're alive and murder them? I'm confused <laughs> them. about what he thinks is going to happen, but apparently... <laughs> Duffy thinks there's a big crossover between the the pro-choice anti-gay population and he wants to get ahead of it. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Either way, a lot of people have pointed out a variety of ways that this is stupid. Indeed they have, Eli, but I think we have a real opportunity here to use pro-force birthers arguments against them. So without further ado, Senator Sean Duffy, welcome to the show. Oh, hey, thanks for having me, Rabbi. Nope. Nope. Um, like, like a gay thing? Also, no. Hmm. I think you're lying. Anyway, thanks for having me. Right. Uh, So I invited you on here today to talk about what many would consider some hypocrisy on your part. Oh, no, um, I I don't know any magic. You know, yep, got it. But you understand how your pro-life and anti-gay beliefs seem to conflict here, right? I do not. Okay, that's fair. Uh, Let's see if I can approach this from a different angle. Can you tell me the exact second a gay fetus becomes a gay person who you don't want to have rights? Uh, Because if you can't. uh, Oh, my God. Love is love. I totally get it. I figured that was going to work. All right. Well, we're going to give Sean a second to catch up here. I love the birdcage. So we're going to take a quick break for a word from this week's sponsor, ZipRecruiter. You guys want to go dancing? No. Yes. No. Hiring can be a slow process. Kathy Altura's COO, Dylan Miskowitz, needed to hire a director of coffee for his coffee company, but he was having trouble finding qualified applicants, so he switched to ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you, it finds them for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job, so you get qualified candidates fast. Dylan posted his job on ZipRecruiter and said he was impressed by how quickly he had great candidates apply. He also used ZipRecruiter's candidate rating feature to filter his applicants so he could focus on the most relevant ones. And that's how Dylan found his new director of coffee in just a few days. With results like that, it's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at our web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G. ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It's a slut, right? Cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. All right, so we're going to open up with an update that includes some good news. But don't get excited. It's twim good news. So it's just the barest minimum non-evil thing happening. This story starts about three years ago when 26-year-old Kandil Balak, who had been dubbed Pakistan's Kim Kardashian, was strangled to death in an honor killing. The murderer was her brother, Mohammed Wasim Azim. The motive was her autonomy. He even admitted as much when he was caught. 
He said, quote, I am proud of what I did. I drugged her first, then I killed her. She was bringing dishonor to our family, end quote. He further justified his actions by saying, quote, girls are born to stay home and follow traditions. My sister never did that, end quote. Now, with a confession like that, you wouldn't think they'd need a trial. But this is Pakistan, so they did. In fact, at the time he committed this heinous act, it wasn't even particularly illegal. Sure, there was a law in Pakistan against murder, but there was a loophole that would allow the family of the victim to pardon the killer. Well, in the wake of this particularly public case, the nation's parliament unanimously passed a law rescinding that right. Well, on Friday, that new and improved law got its first test, and Condil's killer was sentenced to life in prison. And that's a good thing. It's good that Pakistan has decided at long last that murdering women is illegal, even if they're uppity. That being said, Muhammad wasn't alone in this. Sure, he's the one that killed her, but several other men assisted in either planning his crime or keeping him in hiding afterwards. And all of them were found not guilty. So yeah, Pakistan is willing to punish the killer, but they don't want to go overboard. Still, any step in the right direction is worth celebrating, especially in that part of the world. And speaking of crazy parts of the world run by religious zealots, our next story comes from Brazil. You thought I was going to say America, didn't you? Anyway, so there's a billionaire Brazilian bishop named Adir Macedo who made his money through being a blatant fucking fraud, like even for a bishop. His church has been involved in money laundering, child sex trafficking, and outright theft. But apparently that's not enough to dig him out from behind the pulpit. Well, he made news for a different reason this week. During a recent sermon, he reminded the young ladies in his flock not to go to college. After all, if they did that, they'd risk being smarter than their husbands, and then how would they ever find happiness? Other than, you know, all the ways in which people find happiness. So, newsflash jackass, women can be smarter than their husbands regardless of their education. In fact, given the standard that you're setting for your gender, they almost can't help it. Anyway, I'm going to go hit myself in the head with something until I'm dumb enough to be happy. Until then, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in breast-kept secret news. Nice. The state of Oklahoma, Anna. What are the guys talking about? <laughs> yep, it's the newest, the greatest Christian freak out. Yep. So the state of Oklahoma is freaking out this week after women got a right <laughs> in Colorado. Well, yeah. Not in Oklahoma, but also <laughs> right. in Oklahoma. They're freaking out. This is pretty great how it all worked out. So thanks to a ruling by the 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, a local ordinance in Fort Collins, Colorado, that banned public female nipples was declared unconstitutional. Turns out you're not allowed to make lady laws huh. just for ladies. <laughs> Who'd have thunk? It also turns out that Oklahoma is one of the five states that's covered by the jurisdiction of the Tenth Circuit. So now the Oklahomans might have to see a booby, and they are in <laughs> full panic mode. And just for the record, another one of those five states is Utah. So any minute, we'll probably. Oh my God, be it's hearing, a nipple. Like, it's a nipple. Yep, there it is. There it is right, Gosh, right away. Darn nipples. I just, I want to point out, by the way, that I had already planned my trip to Tulsa this weekend before this ruling. It has nothing to do Allegedly. with the movies. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> Noth I wondered why you were movies. following so many Google sites about Supreme Court decisions. I see what's going on now. <laughs> Circuit courts. Yeah, so this one seems pretty clear. Um, we don't need Chet Chetley in a full game of Make It Black to figure this one out. You can't make a law about black nipples only, nor about female nipples only. Nonetheless, following this extremely obvious ruling, Oklahoma City attorney Noble McIntyre responded by saying, No. <laughs> Apparently, the state can just arrest women anyway if they feel like oh, it, really? according to McIntyre. Yeah. yeah. He said, quote, it's still against Oklahoma state law. Women who go topless in Oklahoma could still be arrested and would have to argue this ruling as their defense. And at that point, the judge would have the option of either dismissing the case or saying, no, 
<laughs> that ruling only applies to Fort Collins, Colorado. Wait, end quote. what? Yeah. You know, you guys can follow the law, hire courts or not. We're really just in this for the robes, so whatever you yeah, guys want right. to do. <laughs> no, it's like I've always said, the key to good law is ambiguity. The judge can just decide if it's illegal after you're arrested. Makes perfect fucking sense. <laughs> Am I in a 13th Amendment mood today? <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, 14th. From, t- t- <laughs> from maybe 15th too. I don't know. They do a lot yeah, of weird I, shit in Oklahoma. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so here's something else that got mentioned by official people in Oklahoma. A law enforcement official from Tulsa also weighed in on the subject and pointed out that even if the ruling from the federal court does get enforced, women still aren't allowed to present their nipples in a sexual way. What? They can't touch the nipples or say things that are sexual in reference to the nipples <laughs> while they bring them out and present them, which is a weird phrasing. Oh. I present my nipples <laughs> unsexually. I don't know what that means. Like you just have to mumble baseball, baseball, baseball the whole time. But I, like, I don't understand. And yeah. uh, we also got an extremely offensive and unconstitutional response from Oklahoma state representative, Jim Olson. He made a lengthy post on Facebook explaining that Oklahoma couldn't hear you and that he's pretty sure the Bible overrules the federal court system. Also, just no. And he literally used the phrase silly woman two different times Jesus during that post. Christ. Yuck. And of course, this led to a giant series of comments explaining how fucking laws work. And also, this was a fun part of that comment section, it led to a photograph of a very large man displaying his extremely voluptuous breasts at an Oklahoma State football game. Right. But was he saying, yep, I see that picture. And the question is, I'd like to dwell on this picture for a second. In this photo, is he saying anything sexual about his nipples? (laughs) Yeah, well, right, right. Yeah. (laughs) He's just saying football, football, football. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's fine by me. It's okay. So, yeah, I'm thinking this whole controversy it it's ridiculous, but it does present an interesting opportunity. We're already seeing topless protests all over uh, the state and considering all the other bigotry built into their state government. I want to see their fucking heads explode when they try to figure out what happens when a trans woman goes topless and then uses the ladies. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, war games. War games. The only way to win is yeah, not to right. play. They're just going to start spinning around like yep. an evil computer with a bl- glitch. Yeah. With a boner. (laughs) And an erection, yes. And finally tonight, in putting on the hits news tonight, Christian apologist and man who tastes like a wallet that's been crying, Ray Comfort, (laughs) donned a tinfoil butt plug and did a bunch of cartwheels in an open field this week, hoping that sweet, sweet atheism scorn lightning would strike once again. Okay, but that's, that's absurd. We've been pushing for rhythmic gymnastics to adopt the butt plug as an apparatus for years. We're not going to get well. Yeah, but as I, as I've been saying that whole time, when it comes to butt plugs, it's not about how long you push; it's about how hard. See, full of wisdom oh. here on the skating atheist. So here's Technical the story for the uh, two people who haven't heard it. Um, I feel like Ray's floor exercises routine is plenty of story. <laughs> but go ahead with the rest of it. Yeah. Okay, so 500 years ago, Ray Comfort was the host of a Christian VHS delivery TV program called The Way of the Master, (laughs) co-starring Kirk Cameron's repressed homosexuality. (laughs) On that show, he featured a segment where he proved that God existed because bananas are easy to eat and then did 22 minutes of blowjob mime without realizing it. (laughs) And Kirk Cameron spent 22 minutes giggling like an idiot and trying to jump in for his turn with the banana like it was double dutch. <laughs> well, luckily for all of us, this caught on a little bit way back in the day, and the world was united in a way it wouldn't be again until 9-11 and that weak Pokemon Go came out, laughing at Ray Comfort all together in peace and harmony. However, it's 2019 now, and Ray is sure of two things. One... We weren't laughing at him. We were laughing with him. And two, it's time for a comeback, baby. (laughs) Oh, God, I wish he could make a comeback, as that would imply some period of absence. (laughs) That's fair. That is fair. (laughs) Spin off this banana like fucking Frazier. It's going to be great. (laughs) Yeah. 
So that attempted comeback took the form of an ad for his newest film, The Fool, this week, which makes similar arguments about an orange. Here's what Ray had to say about citrus on the program in the ad on YouTube for his other YouTube. Quote, <laughs> have you ever thought about the fact that oranges, like bananas, have been made with a non-slip surface, what? just the right size and shape, to fit in the human hand? How each one is packaged to take anywhere orange drink filled with natural sugars, vitamins, minerals, and enzymes? Of course you haven't. What? Not what? if you're an atheist. You probably don't even know there's a right way to open it. So you can pick up the math-sized, math-shaped pieces. All coming to you, courtesy of the maker. End quote. <laughs> all right. Well, I cannot wait for season two. Just Ray blowing a watermelon as best he can. <laughs> See? Perfect size and shape. I got it. I got this. <laughs> also, did he honestly think that a banana, literally the cartoon example of something slippery, has a non-slip surface? <laughs> yep, yep. Wow. I just, I love that he realized that the phallic shape of the banana was the issue, and his response was, well, luckily, there's no easy reference to male genitalia one can derive from me talking about gripping balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sadly, aside from us, of course, this one did not catch on in the same way, probably because he didn't like shove an orange up his ass or hold two oranges at chest height and <laughs> rotate them to demonstrate their size or something. But point is, Ray Comfort, he's playing the hits. He's going to be at a county fair near us soon. <laughs> Rock it out. <laughs> This horned melon is difficult. I should have this through. Dragon fruit. Fuck. All right. Well, I find it hard to believe that his palpable fear over meeting me in a rap battle and the fact that he's trying to switch up the last minute to the least rhymable fruit in the universe are probably related. So on that vindication, I think we can close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Flim flam f Jim, less than or equal to. What? And when we come back. We'll worry about bears in schools. For years on this show, we read holy books and works of apologetics together in an effort to better understand the mind of the Christian. And I guess it was moderately useful, but it pales in comparison to how easy it's been to get into the Christian headspace when I have someone describe a book I've never read with naked bias. So in that vein, we're going to be returning to Mama Bear Apologetics with another edition of God Awful Books. Indeed. So, as our listeners will recall, last chapter we learned that people who bought this book should buy this book. And terrifyingly, <laughs> Hillary Morgan Ferrer, who created a website, podcast, Christian training course, and book centered around being a Mama Bear, is not a mama or a bear. Yep. Proving mm -hmm. once and for all that Beachbody never should have rejected my workout program. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Beached body was a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. That's for the people. It's because of the stupid it's ordinary yeah, it's, a, body people. The thing, legal thing with Autumn Calabrese. I don't want to get into it. So yeah. now it's time for chapter three, the discerning mama bear, colon, the refined art of chew and spit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please be a sex thing. Please. It's clearly a sex thing, right? No, sadly, it is not a sex thing. But what? discernment is a three-syllable word. So we're going to spend the first couple paragraphs of this chapter informing the reader that it is not, in fact, an ice cream flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I was chewing and spitting ice cream just like a wine taste, and this <laughs> felt refined and artsy. Should I not? Yeah. So the point of this section is that discernment is not finding everything you disagree with someone or something about. No. Nope. She doesn't tell it what it is. Well, just, it isn't that. Though. It's just not all <laughs> disagreement, which means either she doesn't know the definition, I'm betting on that, or she literally couldn't think of anything discernment couldn't be that isn't that. <laughs> so... With a definition that muddled, it's time for a subsection called The Party Nobody Wants to Attend. Eli, for the last time, we're not going to celebrate your birthday on Ann Coulter's grave. She's still alive. I mean, we could have... <laughs> not in the show. No, Nobody heard that. Not. Nobody okay, heard well, that. Well, we could have. We could have. So this section is about how Christianity can sometimes seem like the party of no. 
And that's a party no one wants to attend. Quote, if we Christians are constantly focusing on our areas of disagreement, then we've basically become the food critics of Christianity. We sit back, create nothing, but tear down anyone else brave enough to try. End quote. What? Which is super not what food critics no. do. No! <laughs> <laughs> and my amazing marshmallow squares somehow only took second place last year at the Church Bake Off. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was talking about the refined art of discernment. So I'm sorry, but this statement cannot be correct. If Christians are X, then they will become the Y of Christianity. That cannot, you can't even phrase something (laughs) like that. Wait a minute. And also, also, you guys are the anti-drinking, anti-sex, anti-gay, anti-drug, anti-dancing people. And you think that the reason people don't want to go to your parties is because you critique their food? What the (laughs) fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. So that begs the question. Don't worry. We got a segment. So how are we defining discernment? And according to HMO, quote, biblical discernment means identifying both the good and the bad. Right. Like, for example, (laughs) slavery, bad. Slaves recovering days later, good. It's good that that they recover. Biblical discernment. Yeah. Yeah. She, She compares it to a food allergy. So this chapter, just to be clear, if we're following the metaphor, is about teaching your kids which ideas they are allergic to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that tracks. Christian kids are very much like a dog trying to eat a thumbtack. And <laughs> being like, drop it, drop it. Yeah. Drop it. Certainly what it seems like, right. But her point here is that it's all well and good to control the movies, TV, and books your kids have access to, but eventually you've got to teach them to properly censor themselves, or as she puts it, real quote, When it comes to the media, we cannot do this by simply labeling things as safe slash dangerous or Christian slash non-Christian, end quote. Jesus, is the the next subheading shackles? (laughs) (laughs) I wish it would be clearer and more honest. Yeah, right. (laughs) What she has in mind is a section called the chew and spit method of discernment. Actually, don't drop the, the tack yet. Chew the thumbtack. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Maybe spit it. Maybe swallow it. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Yeah. So here's how she begins that section. And again, these are real quotes. Quote, I have a shocking little statement for you. There are no Christians so theologically sound that they are never wrong. And there are no atheists so bad that they are never right. End quote. Well, that's true. Okay. No, that's true. In the way that... Hillary Morgan Ferrer doesn't always traffic in child pornography is a true statement that we can all agree with. (laughs) Totally true. She does, however, walk back that bridge building in a footnote saying, quote, to be fair, I must qualify my statement about there being few things that can be labeled all dangerous. Much like the fatty parts that I caught off my steak, there are certain elements of pop culture that can be tossed outright, like pornography. We can safely discard pornography without any fear that we were missing out on a nugget of truth, end quote. But mom, I was just chewing on this dick. I was totally about to spit. <laughs> I was going to just give me a minute. I love I, Does she think we're going to pornography to find the nuggets of truth? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so the example she uses here is R-rated movies. I mean, sure. Most of them are about S-E-X and are straight from the devil. But some of them teach valuable lessons, like her real example that she uses in the chapter, Requiem for a Dream. Oh, really? What? (laughs) Yep. Wow. I'm not kidding. Here's the quote. For example, there was one movie produced in the late 1990s that portrayed the journey of a guy and girl descending into the world of drugs. The movie showed the various physical and psychological stages that accompany addiction and the cough lengths people will go to to get their (laughs) next fix. And will real quote, which I am 100 percent sure is a double ended dildo joke. I'm pretty sure it is. Literally is. (laughs) She's just like, all right, spit out the heroin, spit it. Out. I, this analogy got away from me. I thought we were going to yeah. give me back my shoulder massage. too. <laughs> she, she concludes, quote, what did I do after I finished watching it? I got on my knees. Interesting. She's going to get herself some heroin. Yeah. <laughs> and I praised God for what he had protected me from. Oh, oh, OK. Mm, yeah. This movie reminded me how 
with a few wrong decisions, I could easily have been one of those teenagers who got caught up with the wrong crowd and descended into drug culture. End <laughs> quote. Well, okay, so so she sat there for a long time thinking about taking a two-headed dildo ass to ass with Jennifer Connolly, is yeah. what she's admitting mm -hmm. in her book. Join the club. Right. But he <laughs> chewed that. <laughs> yeah. But her point is that you don't need to reject everything from the larger world. If you already know with 100% certainty what is right and what is wrong and instantly reject any ideas that disagree with your worldview, you know, chew and spit. <laughs> Christianity is chew and swallow. <laughs> yeah, she's close. Yeah. Just like upside down and backwards. <laughs> so now it's time for subsection called the consequences of not teaching our kids to chew and spit. Throat babies. <laughs> right. So, again, she points out that if you just divide everything into good and bad and Christian or not Christian, then they might miss some bad stuff when Christians say it or good stuff when atheists say it. Or as she puts it, quote, I've heard F-bombs from a pastor during a sermon. Really? And I was surprised at some of the excellent points Karl Marx made in the Communist Manifesto. Absolutely not. End quote. Nope. I want to know so bad what good points HMO thinks the Communist Manifesto makes. <laughs> I like the part about table, glass of water, Hitachi wand. <laughs> <laughs> there's oh. no way she's read the Communist Manifesto. Nope. It's, None it's, scenario. it's 23 pages long and there's no fucking way she's still read it. No. Yeah. Yep. Almost a double dozen. No way. She also has a moment that is so close to self-realization in this subsection. She's like, oh, yeah. Also, if you tell your kids that like Lady Gaga is the devil and then they listen to some Lady Gaga, they'll, they'll realize you're full of shit. But her solution isn't like, hey, so don't be full of shit. It's like be super specific with your shit. So like Lady Gaga isn't the devil. Gay rights are the devil. Or right. as we call it. Having your gay and beating it too. <laughs> well done, sir. Yeah. So that means it's time to roar like a mother. Are you guys uh, ready? Uh, all right. So she buttered us up for the F bomb and then fails to pull the trigger in this subsection. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> Coward, yep. Hillary. So this is where HMO is going to introduce us to our handy dandy acronym for stopping your kids from thinking. Roar, which stands for. <laughs> Recognize the message. That's Ertum. Ertum. <laughs> Offer discernment. Odd. Of Ertum odd. Affir affirm the good and reject the bad. Argue for a healthier approach. <laughs> Afaha. <laughs> and reinforce through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. Ertum. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know Wait, what it is. Wait, so the whole is. acronym is Ertum odd. <laughs> Ahafa Okay. I, I believe it's pronounced. <laughs> yeah, doing the math on that acronym was like 90% of her writing process for this book. And it came out like that. She's like, okay, I need fucking discipleship to be an R. <laughs> can I, wait, can I just road like a mother? Fuck, no, that's stupid. Road? Who would. Really get into discipleship? <laughs> really? No. I just, I love that she recognizes that her, her readers are going to need an acronym to remember, don't just be a shrieking bigot, right? Or, or <laughs> sorry, don't be a one-dimensional, predictable shrieking bigot. <laughs> yeah. So this is a multi-step process. Step one, recognize the message. Mm-hmm. And this is a four-part process, recognizing the okay, message. Let's just call that step zero. <laughs> yeah, co comprehension. She's broken comprehension into four steps. Step one, understand the words that are coming out of their mouth. <laughs> Pretty much, Have yeah. thinking. Done. <laughs> so here's her thought on part one of hearing. Uh, quote, <laughs> Identify the messages that are being presented. They all have one or more. Except maybe that song about there being millions of peaches. I think those dudes were just high. End quote. Giggle. What? Doing the math on those peaches was another 9% of the <laughs> process. And like, I wonder how many peaches she thinks there, there are. There definitely are millions of peaches. <laughs> yeah, there clearly are. What? Oh, gosh. So part two. I love that song. Quote. Also. Along with your kids, identify which values the creators are elevating. 
Here are her examples. Freedom, autonomy, sex, drugs, pride. <laughs> Which values are they demeaning? Humility, responsibility, traditional gender roles. Oh, gosh. Oh, Lovely. Now, you see, kids, Superman that hoe does glorify sex, but... <laughs> It reinforces traditional gender roles. That that's the takeaway. There's some good and some bad. <laughs> Two and Spit kids. out the cum. Two, <laughs> keep the gender role part. Yeah. Three. Try to piece together the worldview behind the message. What do you think the artist's definition of good and bad is? What about moral and immoral? What is a good life? The life that reflects success, according to their art or writing. Is it money? Lots of romantic relationships? Freedom from rules? Uh, yes. <laughs> she, she's describing happiness. Now spit out the happiness. Is that the point of that? <laughs> and then four, part four of one in the algorithm here. Yeah. If you're watching a movie, identify which characters and qualities are presented in an attractive way. Pay attention to the traits that are exhibited by the villains. The protagonist and antagonist are often archetypes or representations of ideas. <laughs> uh, pro tip, characters often have traits. Yeah. Look at that. Like 4B is going to be, remember to blink and regulate your body temperature. Yep. <laughs> and I just really, really want to know if she did this with the Bible, right? Oh, yeah, good question. <laughs> this Morning Star guy feels really protagonisty. Fuck, what? <laughs> Okay, that means it's time for step two, offer discernment. Well, hopefully she's had a chance to look up that word since the start of this segment. She has not, but don't no. worry. <laughs> step two is a three-step process. So Great. getting into subsections here, but the first okay. part. Start with sound waves. Yeah, Got exactly. it. First part of steps two is seeing things accurately. Photons. Right? <laughs> Let's circle back. Yeah, we're getting Does some good advice Does everybody know what a photon here. is? <laughs> she even mentions not setting up straw men and to accurately represent what your opponents believe. Uh, but don't worry, in case you were wondering that HMO was coming to any conversation with honesty, this is how she talks about finding the good in people. Really, quote, we are not dealing with enemies. We are dealing with captives. End quote. <laughs> Listen, I know that guy Plato chained us in this cave, obviously, but <laughs> I could swear that was the shadow of an atheist slave walking past, right? That was clearly what happened there. Yeah. All right. Idiot. So, so now we're dealing with that hippie, what if other people aren't evil bullshit. It's time to point out the evil. Here's her quote on that. A friend of mine used to tell his kids what you tolerate today, you accept tomorrow. What you accept today, you embrace tomorrow. I would add a third statement to that. What you embrace today, you promote tomorrow. We have seen this progression within the realm of sexual ethics, have we not? <laughs> and what you promote today, you have gay sex tomorrow, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Georgie. Okay, that's equal parts insane, stupid, and terrifying, right? Because it's completely wrong. Remember, kids, if we let the Jews have their religion today, we're all going to be Jews by Wednesday. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I think a lot of her readers would agree with that statement. No. <laughs> okay, so now it's time for step three. Argue for a healthier approach. And she begins this by giving the definition of arguing, which is just super bummer. But that's understandable <laughs> because her advice in step three is have evidence to support your case which is great, except she gives literally no examples. Well, and, and when your argument is if you tolerate gays, you'll end up having to gay fuck eventually. You can't have examples. So much so <laughs> that I'd normally endorse this. I feel like it's bad advice for her listeners, right? Yeah, exactly. So literally, she says that many modern scientists didn't recognize the true things in the Bible till they discovered them. So, um. you know... That's how the time dimension works. Yeah. That's you not know. true, but that's how they would discover things. Yeah, make sure you whip out the scientific truths in the Bible, everybody. <laughs> yeah, you can break out of jail with a very small pickaxe inside the Bible. A rock yep. hammer, yeah. yeah. Salvation with Exactly. So with that out of the way, it's time for step four in Roar. Reinforce through discussion, discipleship, <laughs> and prayer. And this part is... You can't just talk, Christian. You got to be Christian. Or as HMO puts it, quote, 
We can talk all day long, but the real battle takes place on our knees, end quote. <laughs> I just want to play the national anthem when they're on their knees like that. They just start panicking. <laughs> Fuck, what do we do? Which is it? It ah, uh, <sighs> Blue Lives Matter. And got, by, by the way, Atheist, this is why we're destined to prevail. Her chapter literally ends with a call to inaction. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, it does. gentlemen, it is time for some discussion questions. Are you ready? Sure, why right. not? <laughs> One, icebreaker. What is the grossest thing you've ever actually eaten? <laughs> what? And I love this icebreaker because it means... Hundreds, if not thousands of Christian moms all over our fine nation read this question and then as a group had to pretend the answer wasn't come. <laughs> <laughs> also dads, I'm sure. Let's, let's, dozens, let's be honest, dozens. And <laughs> yeah. by the way, that's it. Lucinda is absolutely going undercover at Hill Dogs Book Club. <laughs> yep. Just to, <laughs> ass. <laughs> just to ruin her meeting. Have two votes. Uh, number two, main theme discernment means both affirming the good and rejecting the bad what are some examples of things in pop culture that polarize people uh the overwhelming consensus of scientific experts <laughs> yeah, <that's> apparently <laughs> yep. yeah have you ever completely disagreed with someone about something you thought was bad y'all ever do that thing in the morning where you're sleeping but then you ain't sleeping anymore all of a sudden <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about if you ever disagree with someone <laughs> what Pick something to discuss, such as a TV no. show, movie, <laughs> book, political no. view, or a way of thinking, and talk about the good and the bad. What good can be swallowed? What needs to be spit out? Uh, okay, I will say a good one to spit out. The idea in this book of in-mouth testing stuff. <laughs> yep, <laughs> never, never a great idea, ever. Three, self-evaluation. Do you have a tendency to label things as either safe or dangerous for your children? What ages and personality types do you think this method is appropriate for? What ages or personality types might this method be inappropriate for? Why? Okay, this is so fucking amazing, right? Because Christians are so used to labeling benign shit like TV shows and music as dangerous that she's discussing this without it ever occurring to her that there are actual real dangerous things. Right. Yep. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I look at this question and I say, what's the right age to let your kids drink bleach and get into mommy's pills? Because I use the word dangerous to mean able or likely to cause harm like the <laughs> dictionary does. There's your problem. All right. You guys ready for a brainstorm? It's oh, time yeah. for a brainstorm. What are some ways that you can take your children's media or interests and teach them to chew and spit? Okay, we've been talking about stepmom porn this whole time, right? <laughs> so, well, For the whole We have, segment. we have, yeah. yeah. And we hear find me. Guy, for sure. <laughs> uh, and then five, it's the end of the chapter, so it's time to release the bear. Pick one song or movie that your child likes and listen to it. Or watch it together. Identify the no. good aspects that align with God's truth. Identify the aspects that don't. Remind your children how important it is that they practice this kind of discernment with all books, movies, music, and ideas. All right. Well, after investing an entire chapter on turns out some rap music isn't evil, I can only imagine what banality <laughs> awaits us in the next installment of God Awful Books. Before we're overtaken by the theme song tonight, I want to remind you that you still have time to get tickets to see us live in New York on October 12th for a double-double header, a citation needed. And if you're going to be on the wrong coast for that, but you still want to get your live podcast fix in, our friends Andrew Torres and Thomas Smith are doing a live record of the Opening Arguments podcast live in L.A. on the same night. We'll have links to get tickets to both in the show notes. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday and an even newer episode of our half-sister show Citation Needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I need to thank Heath Enright for being the wind beneath my wings, Eli Bosnick for being the wind over my wings, which, if, if you know anything at all about aerodynamics, is every bit as important, and the lovely and talented Lucinda Illusions for being my wings. But most of all, of course, I need to thank this week's and last week's best people... Kaylee, Luke, Mikhail, Robert, Dabo, David in Kentucky, Nash, Quasi, Alamoto, Scott, Robert, John, Dennis, Garrett, Stephen, Brian, Ryan, the Spectre of Democratic Socialism, the Medium Atheist, Crafty, Removing My Name, Christian, James, Lexi, Ashley, Lauren, Dave, Darren, Mark, Charlie, Jonathan, Maurice, Brismali, Hebrew Hooligan, Literal E, Profile, Asha, Dana, Jacob, Sage, Mitchell, Jesus, Ate All My Ferrets, and Spaguter, Intruder. 
whose IQs are so long they end in to be continued. Together, these 50 fine folks furnish financial furtherance of our fuck-filled fulminations against the forces of faith this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the keen reflexes it takes to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash whereby you'll earn early access to an extended app-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingadios.com. And if you'd like to help but you can't do the money thing, you'd also be helping us a ton if you leave a five-star review wherever they'll let you do that, and you can follow us on Twitter at PIATPod. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark. We also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with the permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingadius.com. You know, Eli, I'm going to get you a fucking uh, a Dvorak keyboard because it won't make any difference. <laughs> Not for me. Nope. <laughs> We could just get him a red button. He'd love to put, <laughs> I'll hit it. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.